In 1872, uh, Victoria Woodhull uh, became the first woman to run for president of the United States. Um, interesting quirk of history, she wasn't actually old enough to run for president, but the Equal Rights Party embraced her as its candidate, um, and she ran as a third party candidate with Frederick Douglass, the uh, uh, very prominent abolitionist figure, the, the Eastern Shore native who, who um, escaped from slavery in Talbot County and went on uh, to write his uh, memoir, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, and become a leading figure um, in, in politics in the United States. So Victoria, as, as the presidential candidate, and Frederick Douglass as the vice presidential candidate, ran in, in 1872 um, and as the first uh, f woman uh, and the first African American on a presidential ticket. So let's consider the story of Victoria Woodhull, Victoria Claflin Woodhull, um, who shows us through her career uh, the deep connections between spiritualism and progressivism in the 19th century. Uh, radicalism, liberalism, uh, various uh, radical and liberal progressive causes. Uh, Victoria Woodhull was not only a spirit medium, but she was also um, a big part of women's suffrage uh, and the free love movement, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But spiritualism in general was uh, bound up with uh, movements to abolish slavery um, and to achieve rights for women. Um, so the spiritualism as a practice was always uh, sort of on, on the very cutting edges of culture and society, in no small part because it was advocating a, a series of religious beliefs that were um, outside of the norm. Um, so the people who were attracted to spiritualism also generally tended to have these progressive political ideas about uh, reshaping culture and society. So Victoria Woodhull uh, was born September 23, 1838 in Homer, Ohio. Um, this is uh, much like the frontier territory that uh, various uh, other spiritualisms uh, founders uh, were associated with, uh, Fox Sisters in, in Rochester, New York, and, and uh, Cora Richmond, uh, born originally in New York and then uh, moved out to Wisconsin. At the age of three, a uh, close friend and caretaker by the name of Rachel Scribner, essentially her babysitter, passed away, and her spirit visited uh, Victoria and brought her uh, in spirit to the world of spirits, uh, opening up her mediumistic capabilities. She sees a vision at the, of the end of the world and the establishment of paradise on earth uh, during this, this encounter with this spirit uh, at this very young age. And, and it's these visions that uh, put, uh, well, according to Victoria, it's these visions that put her on the path to seeking out um, radical change in, in American culture and society. She's married very young. Um, she's about 14 years old uh, when she marries a doctor by the name of Canning Woodhall, who she meets um, while she's uh, communicating uh, with spirits. Uh, um, he, he comes to her house. Uh, she falls ill. Um, and, and he looks after her, um, and, and very shortly thereafter they're married, uh, which is not so unusual in the 19th century to get married at such a young age. But it turns out that Canning Woodhall is, is not such a swell guy. He's an alcoholic, um, and uh, he delivers their first child while drunk, um, and uh, in the process um, he snips the uh, umbilical cord too close um, and the child bleeds quite a bit and, and ends up becoming uh, mentally incapacitated um, throughout his life. Uh, the child's name is Byron um, and stays with Victoria for, for her entire life. Uh, but, but this uh, first alcoholic marriage reveals to Victoria the pitfalls of uh, the marriage institution as it exists. Um, she divorces Canning, um, which, which is not easy to accomplish in the 19th century. Divorce was somewhat difficult to come by. Um, and she subsequently meets a man by the name of James Harvey Blood, uh, who was uh, an officer in the Civil War on the Union side. Um, and Colonel Blood uh, and Victoria become very close. Um, they marry and they move to New York, where Victoria starts her progressive career. Um, she regularly meets, or so she tells us, with the spirits of Demosthenes, who's an ancient Greek thinker, Napoleon, and Josephine, the former emperor of France, and his wife. She gives frequent consults as a spiritual physician uh, and claims uh, to make uh, around $700,000 as a spiritualist medium with which she supports her relatives. Victoria, throughout her life, is responsible for her entire family. 
um, and supports a great many of them who, who tend to lean on her and, and uh, can be a great bother to her throughout her, her career. Um, her sister, Tenny C. Claflin, uh, works as a spirit f uh, healer, um, and her father uh, sort of well, travels around with a sort of medicine show where he advertises a cancer cure. Uh, Tenny, Tenny certainly um, is, achieves some interesting insight uh, through what she believes to be spiritual contact. Uh, she's um, able to see uh, the source of, of people's injuries, and, and she's able to prescribe things to them. Uh, but her father uh, takes advantage of that in order to sell this cancer cure that is uh, really no cure at all, but, but um, tends to make the patients even worse, and, and they're run out of uh, several towns as a result. So Victoria, um, uh, being Tenny's older sister, sends for Tenny to come and live with her. Uh, and the sisters together become a, a major part of, of the progressive movement uh, in, in New York and, and in the country at large. They found a newspaper called uh, uh, the Woodhall and Claflin's Weekly, um, which contributes to the free love movement um, and, and is contributed to by, by major figures, including Stephen Pearl Andrews. Inspired by her spirits, Woodhall drafts a petition stating that an amendment uh, wasn't necessary to give women the right to vote, since all citizens were already guaranteed that right, and only states' laws stood in the way. She asks that the Congress um, uh, move past those states' laws in order to pass uh, uh, general enfranchisement for women across the board. And, and again, Woodhall is claiming um, that, that this legislation she's attempting to achieve on behalf of women um, for, for the right to vote in the 1870s is uh, inspired by her, her spirits. So uh, spirits are playing yet again a major role in politics. She's brought into the suffrage movement, uh, but critics treat her as a liability for her commitment to free love. So let's take a moment now and think about uh, what this free love means. So it does go back to this un unfortunate first marriage she had to, to Canning Woodhall. Uh, in the 19th century, a woman was generally considered to be um, more or less the property of her husband. She was not entitled to divorce him without his consent, um, and, and she could be, um, she had to be sexually available to him at all times. Uh, a, a, a man could essentially rape his wife uh, without consequence. Um, it was a perfectly legal thing to do. So uh, what Victoria Woodhull advocated was a, a complete reform of this movement. She was part of a, a wider movement, um, it, including the Odeina community, founded by jo uh, Joseph Humphrey Noyes, um, in, in which uh, people were rethinking the marriage arrangement as something that need not be so constrictive, um, particularly from a woman's perspective, that a woman should be allowed to pursue a career, that a woman should be allowed to divorce her husband, that a woman had uh, control over her body. Um, so Victoria's free love tended to uh, rub the, the suffragette movement the wrong way because they were very much focused on the right to vote, period. Uh, and introducing this notion of sexual equality and, and uh, sexual freedom um, sort of uh, turned the conversation in, in a direction that they didn't find productive. But all of the reforms that Victoria sought um, came about to a certain extent. Um, people, uh, marriage is now a very different arrangement. And, and looking back on it from the 20th century, Victoria's advocacy for free love certainly makes a lot of sense. Another part of this um, free love advocacy is that Victoria and Tenney uh, were definitely career women. They had this newspaper that they published uh, with all, all their radical ideas about uh, women's right to vote and, and free love, uh, but they were also the first uh, women stockbrokers on, on Wall Street. So here these two spirit mediums, two spirit healers, are the first women to, to trade in stock. And it actually comes about in no small part because of their relationship to mediumship. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, who's that's a name you, you probably have heard, he was a major railroad tycoon. He was one of the uh, so-called robber barons of the 19th century who accrued large fortunes, um, uh, including Nelson Rockefeller and um, Andrew Carnegie. Um, so Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, in the last decade or so, a couple decades of his life, became very interested in spiritualism, and he uh, developed a relationship with uh, Victoria's sister, Tenny, um, as a spirit healer. She would come and provide healing for him. Uh, de the degree to which that healing took on uh, romantic overtones, uh, we can't say. The, the history doesn't pass that down to us. 
But we know that they got close enough that Vanderbilt offered to front the money to Victoria and Tenney to start their own brokerage. And so they did. So uh, again, we see this deep connection between spiritualism, uh, spiritualist mediums, uh, the enfranchisement of women, and the, the advancement of social causes. Um, spiritualism literally opening doors for women to achieve things they haven't otherwise been able to.